We are the Brothers Mahoney. I am Michael. And I am James. Today we are talking about Dalek, which is the sixth episode of the revival series of Doctor Who, which aired April 2005 and written by Robert Shulman. Yeah, this story is generally compared a lot to a sixth Doctor Big Finish audio story called Jubilee, which was also written by Robert Shulman as starring Dr. Eveline Smythe as their companion. Now, my brother and I have not listened to this story yet. We're, we're quite a bit away. But two things. It's one, very well regarded from everything I've heard in, in a lot of ways. And this story, again, since it's written by the same writer, it kind, it kind of creeps from a lot, well, from some of the ideas in Jubilee. And we see the same type of thing later because the highly regarded two part Human Nature, Family of Blood, is based off a book, Human Nature. Yes, a seventh doctor avoids a new adventure novel, which is actually I don't know if that one's expensive now that I think about it. Maybe it is, but a lot of them seem to be. So I would suspect maybe that one's a little more expensive just because it's potentially more sought out. But yeah, perhaps, perhaps. It's always interesting to see sort of a, a new adaptation of a previously released Doctor Who story. I mean, we're sort of expecting the same type of thing with this upcoming fourteenth Doctor episode which seems like it might be based off the fourth Doctor's comic strip, Doctor Who and the Star Beast, which, of course, has the other cute beep the meep. Cute and yet probably terrifying, for uh, if, any, if anything what I've heard is true. Uh, but he is warning us of monsters, so you have to trust him. Mm, I can read, you know. <laughs> so it's always interesting to see like sort of a, another take on the same type of story. And the fun thing is that with the way Conan walks in Doctor Who, both takes apparently are accurate, so... <laughs> yeah, a lot of the case, that seems to be how it goes. Dalek, though, has a pretty easy-going plot. The TARDIS is drawn to an alien museum deep below the Utah desert, where a ruthless villain keeps the last of the Doctor's most fearsome enemies prisoner. And in case that mysterious plot did it clue you in, the episode title probably did, as it is indeed called Dalek. Yeah, a bit, bit of a spoiler for an episode title. I think it was, I, I know what they were going for. Probably would have been better if they hadn't. I mean, we would have guessed it anyway. But it would have been better if they had spoiled it. Probably one in the um, an upcoming and next episode. And yeah. also uh, the name of the episode. Yeah, I heard actually there's a decent amount of complaints with the first season of the revivals upcoming, like coming up next, little previews. I thought the one for the end of the world was pretty subtle, but apparently a lot of them maybe showed too much and I know that they changed up how they did like the coming up next. I think actually the issue might have been that the coming up next came before the credit so you didn't have time to like leave. Oh that yeah that's annoying. Yeah that might have been the issue. If even if you wanted to avoid it you might not have a chance to like turn the channel away. So that might have been what the issue is. But I just read that yeah, some I mean I, I I have to admit I assume we've always watched the coming up next but I don't remember actively having watched them. I just I don't, I don't remember turning away from them. So I don't I know. Have to, yeah, I have to imagine, because we watch a lot of these, I mean, we watch all these revival things, you know, up to some point with our family. So I have to imagine that we would stick around and see, hey, what's coming up next week? Because, well, who does it like? Unless there's a sneak preview of what we might expect. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, it is. it would be nice to go in completely blind, but... Doesn't matter as much as the Reviver series as it does, you know, well, the classic series. But So, one interesting thing after the part with this toy is that it takes place in Utah. No, it takes place out in sort of like an underground museum. So, it's not like you get to see the sites. So you might have to wait until Impossible Astronaut for some of that. Well, it's funny, actually, because now that I think about it, it's very much similar to our last story, The Genocide Machine, which was also a type of, it was a library, not a museum. But it's a museum that nobody gets to go to. My, my Castle Rath had a library absolutely nobody got to go to. So this, this work out pretty well, actually, as we get that story as had Alex. Yeah, that's, that's another fair point. Because when we say museum, we're not talking about like some type of public place where people get to hang out and chill. I mean, it's more like a private collection of this one dick building the guy. Well, he's better than that guy who has some name, but, you know, it's just known as not being Trump. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, in the in the Chibner era. Yeah, this guy. I mean, I'll, I'll give I'll give it to him. He's he's a bit of an asshole, but at least he feels like a human. Yeah, no, he feels like a human, and also, yeah, he's never not an asshole. But like, no, no, the Andrew can 
I mean, I've got fear for him. But he, he again, he seems human. You know, he's like pleading. You know, he, because he, 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 feels, even, he feels a little bad, a little bad. Maybe not a lot, but a little bad about things. And he even like defaults a bit to the doctor, like you know, once the doctor reveals what's you know a bit more of what's going on, he realizes, hey, he knows this thing. Yeah, and in a very awkward. See, uh, my brother and I. Well, of course, we grew up in the United States, so uh, we watched this on Sci-Fi. The fourth season aired on Sci-Fi in the U.S. And they had a very, very awkward commercial break cuts. I very specifically remember one of the cuts from this. I, I can't remember any others, but from this episode, I remember very specifically the doctor is shortless, which, you know, nice fan service. But Christopher Atkinson is shortless, you know, he was being tortured. And then they hail through the radio of Dalek breaking out. And the doctor just looks up, release me if you want to live. And then it just cut to commercial. <laughs> and there's this. Yes, it was the way the scene ended, but it was just so awkward. But yeah, so the fact that this takes place in the USA, but the sighting doesn't really matter much. Again, you don't see any nice landscapes, nothing USA-ish. It's just heads rather than a um, query. Oh, look, rocks. <laughs> That's a, a ni- nice Tom Baker reference. Was that from a Destiny of the Daleks? I believe it's Destiny of the Daleks, yes. Uh, Which is probably the only good thing about Destiny of the Daleks, but we'll get there. And it also takes place in the near future. The plot did the same, but this takes place in a Trandy Travel. Now, merely the tr- Trandy Travel is now in the near past, or 11 years past that. But at the time, the story originally aired 2005, Trandy Travel would, of course, be, see if my math is right, seven years in the future. Yeah, and it's always interesting and kind of strange in source to this. It's Dr. Houston has changed it to this. The 10th Planet, which came out in 1966, would have been. I would imagine so, yeah. Yeah, the 10th Planet took place in 1986. Which, yeah, it's more than seven years. That's, you know, common past by now. And in fact, I know there's at least one Doctor Who story in one of the uh, short trips novels. And have fun trying to get those. Uh, <laughs> but those, uh, those are expensive. Well, the big Finnish ones are expensive anyway. And there's a story in there with uh, Ban and Polly, uh, like meeting up in a hotel and just reminiscing in 1986, knowing that there's somewhere in the Arctic right now, those events are happening. And it's just interesting things like that. I mean, for example, this takes place in 2012. So Amy and Rory are just using the internet. I'm, I'm sure I assume they use the internet <laughs> at points. I, I mean, apparently Van Staten just owns it. It, it's just strange to consider, like, to piece together what we learn, especially in the Reviver series. And, you, you know, taking into account, you know, the things you see in the, you know, classic series too, but mostly it's in the Reviver series. That all of these things are happening on the same earth, generally speaking. If, you know, you have a strange parallel universe one, like uh, Age of Steel. So, yeah, Hanovan Staten owns the internet. And, you know, anybody who we see using the internet, Clara, Amy and Rory, Dana, like, they're all using an internet that's owned by Van Staten. It's just really strange to uh, keep in mind. No, of course, by that point, it's probably more owned by the woman who takes over Van Satin's job. Well, well, that's why I said people like Martha and Dana, because they, at the very least, will be using internet owned by Van Satin, unless you only owned it for like a day. But Yeah, and Henry Van Satin is a pretty powerful guy. Not only does he claim that he owns the internet, which Ross finds somewhat incredulous. No one owns the internet. But not only does he claim he owns the internet, he can apparently actually replace precedents on a whim. Boy, what power that would be. Yeah, and again, I mean, we see... I mean, it never gave... No, it did, did it give his name? Did it say Obama? I guess it did. I don't remember. But we see in the end of time, you know, the American president, who was at that time... He was, he was, yeah, he was clearly designed to sort of be like an Obama standard. Yes, I don't remember if it said the name exactly. It might have just said the U.S. president, the Times it mentioned him. But I guess Van Staten just, you know, was in power at that time and could just choose that. He probably also chose that one really asshole American president that we saw in the in the Utopia Son of Drums, Last of the Time Lord, Season 3, and, in, and you know, that president sucked. He probably deserved the tackle of fame, honestly. I also like Van Staten's... I mean, he's... So he's a billionaire. But it's not like he's one of those ones who refuses to have fun. I mean, he's a fun guy. He, he's a jokey guy. He's intrude the window. It's, it's funny, guys. Yeah, he he's so... As, as the kids would say, he's so cringe. <laughs> yeah. It, it's fun because naturally, you know, he, he makes a, a joke. Oh, how did they get an intrude the window? And all these people following around him. Oh, they just chuck it up. Oh, you're a funny guy, funny guy. 
because naturally they want to coin. Or only, actually, they only do that after he's after like he, they don't react to things like, "Hey, it's funny, people," and then they always start laughing in a very forced fake laughter. It's hilarious. And actually, another note, now that I think on it, about the whole fact that this takes place in Chanti Travan. This is something I did a deep investigation on. But an idea of this story is that Van Staten collects a bunch of alien artifacts. That's what this private collection is, a bunch of alien artifacts. Some of them he knows what they do. Some of them he has no idea. But he collects a bunch of alien artifacts. And at this point in time, in trying to travel, apparently aliens coming to Earth still wasn't any type of public knowledge. So I'm wondering how that computes with some of the other things you see in New Who. The one thing that immediately comes to mind is this whole an Earth. I'm not sure what explanation was given of, of, hey, the Earth just immediately goes to like a different galaxy and then it goes back to the galaxy it came from. I don't remember the specifics, but I, I, that actually specifically was how mentioned. Because remember, Amy didn't know what the Dalek was. And, you know, Matt Smith, you know, named Jeff Drake. How do you not know what the Dalek is? They, you know, the whole Earth moving. And then, like, that, that so that at least had some part to do with the crack in time. Apparently, they were eating up and nobody yeah, remembers and, that they happened. And I think, naturally, this is way before the crack in time idea even came to mind. But I think that's probably a good explanation for a lot of these things that may not quite fit. It's, it's possible there's another explanation somewhere about, oh, hey, and trying to travel from the aliens on public knowledge, but maybe something took place before that. But I think it's always interesting to keep note of that type of thing. Yeah, we will be able to because it's not like we're dra- making our own timeline, although that would be kind of fun, like what we talk about with uh, story placements. But, I mean, it doesn't matter on other planets, really. But when a story is taking place on Earth, just to see what people saw and saw to be aware of. Now, Unic, I'm sure, covered up a lot of there's things they dealt with that they called anyway in the Thor Doctor's era. But I mean, even some of those, like like the Ambassadors of Death, which I think was a pretty public event because they were returning astronauts. So that could have been completely covered up. And I really don't remember much about that one, except that it was kind of way probably too long. But a lot of people seem to laugh at it. So. And that's a, that's a common thing at John Portier's toys. Actually, another thing that comes to mind, and this one is another thing that might be explained somewhere, but Torch Ward as an organization has existed since 17-something. I forget when Tooth and Cloud takes, took place exactly. Yeah, see, if, if we were students of British history, we would be able to know that. <laughs> yeah, but Torch Ward as an organization started in the 1700s. Unit started, what, 1950s maybe? I forget if there's an exact date. Well, according to Chabnall. And as a new team, though, Yunus had a TARDIS on some, in somebody's office the entire time, I guess, the third doctor would have been with Unit. I guess they did it, think you mentioned it to him. Yeah, luckily, we're not here to insult Chimno yet, but believe you me, we will be. <laughs> Boy, I, I mean, I look forward to talking about everything Doctor Who, but I almost dry talking about some of those. L- let me rephrase. There's a lot of Doctor Who that James and I really enjoy. But there's some Doctor Who that we really do not enjoy. And I'm not and sure how much... Has to be, and it all has to be coalesced around a three-season span, too. Yeah, honestly, pretty much. I mean, there's some pretty subpar stories that we'll be talking about. To be fair, there's a lot of stories, somewhat subpar stories, that it's been a while since I've seen. So they might actually be bad there upon revisiting them. Some that come to mind would be like some of Capaldi's toys in the Force of the Night, for instance. Yeah, I'm sorry, that one's not going to be any bad to apparently watching. Eaters of Light might be. I thought Eaters of Light is a creepy. Yeah, Eaters of Light might be. Uh, in the Force of the Night will not be. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's going to be interesting to revisit all of these. But I know some of them are probably not going to be much bad to the second time around. And as much fun as we have saying, oh, this is horrible. I don't necessarily look forward to that. But luckily, it's going to be a while until we get to like particularly poor episodes, in my opinion. I mean, of course, people will always bring up... Well, a Father's Day has a lot more appreciation than it used to. But people will always bring up the 80s Lantern and Fairho from the second season. And Love and Monsters, too. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah I forgot about that one. But one, I actually really like the 80s Lantern over all. I think it's actually a pretty good story. Fear Ho, I don't hate as much as some people. And as for Love and Monsters, I think that one's also gotten more appreciation over time just because of what the story's going for. Yes, yeah, the original Blink. True. And also has a lot of similarities to a pretty good episode from uh, the first uh, season of Torchwood as well. I think it was called Random Sues or something like that. Y- you would remember it if you saw it. Yeah, I know the episode you're thinking about. I just can't remember the name of it. 
Yeah, it's something to do with sewage anyway. All of that aside, though, the idea that Torch Ward and Unit sort of coexisted for some time, and of course, that's our Ratcon. Torch Ward did it exist in our Mate universe until, what, 2006? Yes. With uh, Tooth and Claw. But in Doctor Who universe, Torch Ward's been around for quite some time. I always did wonder what type of relationship, if any, did Torch Ward have with Unit. And that's something that they might go into somewhere that I just wouldn't know about because I've not had that much experience with Torch Ward. Well, I would assume they'll go into it both in the Torch Ward Monthly Big Finish audio stories and the Unit audio stories, because I, not the uh, old ones, but the newer um, ones with uh, Ingrid Oliver, Kate Stewart. Well, I, I mixed up um, actual characters and actors, so... But yes, with the new unit series, I'm pretty sure they're proud. It's at some point, they're going to touch on it and explain it a bit more. It'll just take us a long time to get there. Yeah, so that's, of course, another thing I look forward to. I did like this museum. Well, I guess technically private collection. And the doctor seems somewhat impressed, too. There's a, I think there's an arm of... I'm not going to try to say the species name. But the family Slitheen, the species that they happened to be, there's an arm of one of them, a stuffed arm. And excitingly, there was a Cyberman had. Yeah, and that Cyberman cyber had looked like it had sort of a 80s-ish design. I could easily see, like, Tom Baker, or Peter Davison meeting Cyberman like that. I mean, there's only one Tom Baker story with Cyberman, which really puts into perspective how much they get used nowadays. Like, you, can't, you seem to not be able to go a season without seeing a Cyberman or a Dalek. But back in the day, there's a lot of creativity. We only said Daleks twice during seven years of Tom Baker's reign. We only said Cybermen once, and two of those toys aren't even highly regarded. It is fascinating. No, I don't think it's necessarily a lack of creativity. I think it makes sense that newer writers want to bring back something that they know will have some type of brand recognition, and ideally do something new with it that hasn't been done before. And it can sometimes work. Yeah, but how often does that actually happen? I would say not very often. I would argue at least 50% of Doctor Who Revival's toys at Daleks are at least decent. Like, even some of the, the worst ones, and I'm thinking, like, Victory of the Daleks, which I don't think is even necessarily a bad episode. I, I think the gold parts about it aren't the Daleks. Well, yeah, that, that is true. No, I think you like the one more than me anyway, though. Although, the new paradigm Daleks, they had a classy look to them. Yeah, they had such a classy look, you saw them once more in the novel again. <laughs> I blame the Pandora. My point is, though, that there's not that many... I would argue table Dalek stories or table Cyberman stories. Well, there might be more table Cyberman stories than Dalek stories. Yeah, I, I think that's true, certainly. I mean, if nothing else, look at the Sanson of the Cyberman. Oh, God. Actually, I wasn't even thinking about that one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm. But back to Dalek. The point, though, is that the Doctor sees a heart of a Cyberman, and he, of course, comments on it. Rose has never seen a Cyberman. Not yet. So she asks the Doctor what it is, and he's like, oh, it's an old friend. Well, Anime in his typical Christopher Atkinson style, he has, and you can almost feel sort of I don't want to say a longing, but, but no, reminiscing, yeah, reminiscing. I mean, think about how long the doctor's been alive. I'm not sure when the last time he's encountered the Cyberman, probably sometime maybe during the time war. Well, actually, I can, I can actually probably answer that, but to avoid spoilers, I won't. Oh, okay, so. Um, so uh, I know there happens to be a no there happens to be a prose story where he meets a Cyberman. Oh, before this? Yes. Oh, interesting. With accuracy, no less. So even after the time war. But naturally, the Doctor and Rose were sort of drawn to this private collection. They're sort of going around looking at the artifacts, wondering what was drawing them because they hold there was some type of sort of like an asso ass marsh, it's, you know, reaching out into the galaxy, like, hey, help me, I'm trapped. So they were trying to find out what is signed in this message. And, well, anytime you go into a rich guy's private collection, people are probably going to find out. And that's where they encounter Sam Henry Van Staten, who was played, I think, quite decently by Corey Johnson. But the Doctor and Rose are, of course, taken, not hostage, just taken prisoner because they're in a, as Wilson Fisk would say, they walked the road they were not supposed to be on. <laughs> Um, but I guess they were the Ireland hunt. But no, they were... Yeah, sorry, we kind of rewatched that recently, so that's out of my mind. It's a god for season. Yeah, so they are, you know, just being hard prisoner. Uh, the Doctor very quickly impresses him because he knows what all these alien artifacts are. The, the meeting between them also has... His name is Adam, played by... What's his name? Uh, Bruno Langley? I believe so. Yeah, um, he's this kind of giggy genius thing. Um, 
he's also British, though, so he has a bit of a connection with Rose. Yeah, and he's he's the one who purchases all of Van Staten's alien artifacts. And the doctor, you know, very quickly, you know, can just like name what these items are and knows how to use them. So Van Staten's impressed, and he wants to know what else the doctor knows. So he just takes him um, down to see the prisoner they have. His only life specimen, I believe, he refers to as. And naturally, from the title of the episode, everyone knows what it is. The doctor goes in all sort of calm and like, hey, it'll be okay. And the room's completely dark. And once the doctor says, no, hey, I'm a doctor, this is a voice, dark, tall, and then it becomes magic. Because what is in this room is a dialogue. The doctor. Oh, I thought it was a Slitheen. Oh, it's so close. If only the Slitheen had appeared in the last couple of episodes, it could be. It could have been another one. How would this toy... No, never mind. I don't think you need a sidetrack. I was just wondering how this toy would have been different if it was a Cyberman. Maybe yeah. only Cyberwoman's toy. Well, no. Uh, Cyberwoman's actually better than people give it credit for, I think. Is it Chibna? Surprise. Yeah, it's Chibna, but surprisingly, it's not as bad as all that. But we'll discuss. We, I, I don't know if you have a side. We will discuss the torture and stuff. But, of course, not right yet. So Indeed. But this is the first Dalek the Doctor has run across since he was under the impression he destroyed all of them in the Time War. And it wasn't just the Doctor destroying all the Daleks. I think the Doctor says that there were 10 million Dalek ships destroyed. Now, let's say each ship has at least 800 Daleks on it. That's at least 800 million. That's my, my quality math right there. Yeah, I don't know how many it was, but there's a lot of Daleks. And I believe the Doctor says, I think this is the first episode where he confirms he destroyed both of the species. Yeah, I thought, does the Doctor talking say he killed his own species, or just that both of them are dead? I guess I don't know exactly. But either way, the Dalek figures out that they're dead anyway, so... Yeah, so the Doctor is, well, not too disappointed. The Time War was a very, very traumatic event, and it's still a bit of a mystery. He talks a little bit about it with Ross, but more in a vague sense. He says that his planet Gallifrey is gone. But we don't know that many details. I mean, we know that it sort of trickled down to other species, like the Goth, for instance, who lost the planet and the physical forms because of the time war. And the nasty consciousness. Yeah, that's true too. The nasty consciousness lost a bunch of planets that used for food or something along those lines. Actually, yeah, a lot of this, I forgive the Slavine had anything to do with the time war. No, they were just capitalists. <laughs> Fuck those capitalists. Am I right? But this is the first time the Doctor's run into a Dalek, and he is unhappy. He, he thought he was coming to save potentially an alien or a species that's worth saving, and the Doctor does not find this creature worth saving. Now, admittedly, I can't help, and it's, it's intentional. It's how they write the story. It's how they write the dialogue. I can't help but feel bad for the Dalek. The Dalek seems so pathetic, so sad, especially once the Doctor says, despite the Dalek's intention to reach out to other Daleks to figure out what his orders are, the doctor just tells him, there are no more Daleks, everyone's dead. It takes a second for the Dalek to take that to heart, such as he has a heart. And it's just a sort of a sad conversation. I am alone in the universe with his eyes talk drooping down. It's very depressing. That would actually make a pretty good gift. Yeah, because he later plays it up a bit, well, more than a bit, to trick Rose. But this at least seemed pretty genuine from him. Yeah, he knows he's probably not going to be able to trick the Doctor. This Dalek may have never encountered the Doctor before, but his species knows what the Doctor is. So it's just a, sort of a genuine sadness. I am alone in the universe. And what makes it worse, in my opinion, is that the Doctor, and you know Christopher Atkinson, he, he can sometimes have that sort of gleeful smile. He's like, yep, excited. He's, he's, he's happy that this Dalek is alone in the universe. Yeah, because then, Daleks have caused him so much personal pain that he is, uh, uh, of course, I mean, the Dalek, she has absolutely no sympathy. Even for, for a Dalek in probably the worst situation a Dalek would ever find itself in, has absolutely no sympathy for the Dalek. And it's sort of rich coming from a guy who was sent to, you know, genocide the Daleks, but he actually, he, he didn't, uh, well, he did destroy his car a couple of times. But yeah, a couple of times at least. I do like the Dalek's reply, though, because the doctor's like, yep. And the doctor replies, so are you. Uh, because the, the, doctor, the, doctor, the doctor walked right into that one. The doc, doctor, yeah, his smile sort of disappears, as you, as you can imagine. I mean, it's depressing. Both of these, if that is indeed the last Dalek, and of course we know it's not. There was the whole Dalek, was it Dalek Khan? Uh, there was the Card of Scaro. Card of Scaro, yes. So we, we, we know this isn't the last Dalek, but at this point, as far as these characters know, this is the last Time Lord and the last Dalek. So honestly, if I were them, I'd sort of 
hope they would find some solidarity, some type of com. I mean, they have common ground. They just well, need to well, work well, through the problem, it. The problem is that dialects are not broad for solidarity. Yeah, dialects not broad for solidarity, but it's not like the time are particularly broad for it either. No, I mean, the Doctor, of course, is much like the other Time Lords in Templement, but to be fair, like, I believe Russell T. Davis himself said, yeah, the Time Lords talking how to the Time War, because as Michael just said, they sent the Doctor to try to genocide the entire species before they existed. And it's yeah. fascinating, because naturally we're talking about Genesis of the Daleks, which is a very well-renowned Tom Baker story, and a lot of people consider that sort of one of the first strikes of what leads into the time war. And I think it's just fascinating. There's roots in the classic series. Well, and I think it's for the boss too. I mean, they never explicitly, I don't believe they ever explicitly said it in the Reviver series, but but it's just a nice little thing. And it makes sense too. If somebody, if you use time travel, you try to genocide a species, and that species survives because you don't go through with it, then, you know. They still have the right to be angry. Yeah, they're not going to remember that. And it's not unreasonable for them to be unhappy about it. I mean, granted, they're dialogues, but nonetheless, but on that issue, they were right to be displeased. And the whole scene is such, in my opinion, it's such a large day of seeing the Doctor's first meeting with this dialogue and, you know, who knows how long. I can't remember my exact reaction as a kid because you know, I, I knew what dialogues were probably in just a general sense of who doesn't know what a dialogue is. But I have to imagine for a lot of people who watched Classic Who and then came to watch a Revival series, and seeing Christopher Atkinson and his reactions to this dialogue, well, it was just, I think, done really well. Yeah, I don't remember much myself what I thought when we were watching as a kid. I do remember asking my father if the dialogues were ever portrayed sympathetically or in any way like this in the, in the uh, classic series, and he said no, which from what we've seen, I guess we haven't seen the dialogues must have planned. But I have a feeling not very sympathetic there either. So yeah, that uh, seems like a very reasonable answer. Uh, we also have seen Evil of the Daleks, but given that this story is called Evil of the Daleks, I have a feeling they might not be particularly sympathetic there myself. I would expect not. <laughs> so the thing about this story is that the Doctor came to potentially save this alien crying out for help, and, and that this Dalek's been tortured. The, the whole point is that Van Staten wants to know what this thing is. What does he call it? I always remember Matotron, but that might... I think that's probably... Yeah, that's that's what they were called in Victory of the Daleks. So, so I, I can't remember exactly what Van Staten calls it, but he's excited that the Doctor's able to get a rise out of the Dalek. He's happy that the Dalek is able to speak. And one thing to note before you continue on, I just thought it was pretty fun. I mean, the, before the Doctor finds out there was a Dalek, he's you know lying to the room and he doesn't see anything. He's just saying, hey, I'm sorry. I, I'll try to help you out if I can. Basically, you know, apologizing that the uh, creature is being tortured. But then once he finds out there's a Dalek, he really doesn't care at all. And not only does he not care, but this might be one of the scenes in the Revival series. The Doctor's morality is sometimes crossed to the board. It happens with pretty much every Doctor. Well, let me rephrase, every Doctor in the Revival series. I don't know how many quote-unquote bad decisions the Doctor made in the classic series. Well, I, I, don't, I, I also wonder how many times that happened with Matt Smith. The one thing that comes to mind is a town called Morsi, but maybe I should say anything. I said I don't remember almost anything. I remember the basis of that story, but I have no idea how it actually ends. See, so, I remember the basis of the story, but that's where my morality is different because I think the doctor sort of killed the guy. Oh, it's getting real up in this. But I think most doctors in Revival series have some type of occasional. Actually, yeah, one comes, one does come to mind. The girl who waited, which I thought, and that was a story in uh, series six for the end, which had Amy and Roy, and I thought that really showed a, a bad side of the Doctor. And the thing that annoyed me most about that is that the Doctor never seemed to get much in the way of repercussions from that, even though he really showed up. Yeah, I don't know what repercussions he could have gotten except Roy just leaving, you know, the Doctor. Yeah, but the Roy thing... didn't leave. Well, I know, but the thing is, Amy would have herself. Uh, he, it just, yeah. No matter how traumatized he was, you know, from those events, she did it. She would have left based on just that. But... So. All of these moral failings that some of these doctors sometimes have. I mean, this doctor, the ninth doctor, literally, now it's not too long, but he literally tortures the Dalek. This thing's already been tortured, and he was just told that his first piece is dead, and the doctor tortures it. And that's just a, that's a hard scene. Yeah, it's very disturbing. You know, this character who we've mostly liked. I mean, yeah, he did the whole thing. But he brought back Lady uh, Cassandra just to kill her, which is amusing. But, and Rose wasn't very happy about it. That's actually a good point. This Doctor, I imagine partially because of his experiences in the Time War, 
it doesn't take him quite as long to get to more final solutions. I mean, for instance, he brought the anti-plastic. Now he says he was going to give the nasty consciousness a, a choice, but he still brought it with him, a way to kill this creature. Well, to be fair, I actually believe him there. Uh, I believe him too. I'm not saying, but I'm not sure like Tom Baker would have brought an anti-plastic thing with him when he was facing something down. I think- No, no Tom Baker would have. No, McCoy would have. My McCoy, point, would have, McCoy would have talked into suicide. <laughs> yeah. So my, my point is just that this doctor seems to be able to move to a more final solution a lot quicker than previous doctors might have done. Maybe he's a journal, you know, an American police department. Oh, snap. But, uh, actually, I think we made a joke like that before, but it's still true. But seeing the doctor torturing the Dalek is certainly a disturbing scene. And it leads into Rose. Who, I forget, was Rose watching that on screen? I think she was at that point. Yeah, Adam was with Rose showing off some alien talk and just, you know, talking to her. We find out he's a genius, apparently. I know his backstory doesn't matter that much because Adam never mattered that much. Yeah, the interesting thing about Adam is, yeah, he appears in this episode. He doesn't, in my opinion, he doesn't really do that much. No, he doesn't make a big impression on me. The only thing that's important is he's sort of sciencey and he's British. And I guess he's handsome. Of course, Rose doesn't notice that. Well, I guess, well, the doctor said pretty. And that's really more of a way I describe him because I wouldn't say he's convincingly handsome. He, he, like I said, he kind of, I'm, I'm kind of geeky myself. He just has a more geeky look to him. It's not like he's some, like, hunk, you know, football player. <laughs> I don't know why that's the first thing that comes to mind. But I believe they're watching in his lab. And then the R- Rose convinces Adam to uh, get her access so she can go talk to the creature because he feels so bad for it, basically. And that's another strong scene because the doctor has taken Rose, I mean, at this point, not that many places, but still enough that Rose has some sense of like a deeper universe. So she wants to talk to this creature, console it. It sort of looks scary, but you have to keep in mind that it's like chained up. It's, it seems powerless. In fact, the Dalek, when it first saw the doctor, tried to kill the doctor. And that leads to the doctor like being in a wall, like, hey, let me out, let me out. Actually, that's a very strong scene, too, because it shows just how terrified, like, absolutely terrified this doctor was of just one Dalek. That was a particularly strong emotional scene right there. Yeah, well, what this episode was trying to do in a lot of ways was make Daleks terrifying again, because for a long time. Yeah, they've seen sort of, sort of like almost a joke. Yeah, because people are talking about, oh, they can't climb stairs. Every joke people made about Daleks, this episode tried to rectify in some way. Yeah, which I can appreciate. And it's probably very important in the first season of a revival series to do that. It is. And I think it lasted a pretty good time, too, where the Daleks, when they showed up, they were a terrifying force, whether, whether it was one or whether it was an army. So Rose tries to comfort this Dalek. And at one point, she lays her hand on it with sort of like a, a biometric transfer. See, I'm not much of a science guy. I know the magic transfer completed. <laughs> like as soon as he does it, the dog starts talking in a much stronger voice. We see the dance in its casing straighten out. We see it getting some color back to its casing. And it's just it's basically fronting at that point. Yeah, it's almost immediately revived, and then we get to the you know rest of the episode. Dalek is able to break out. Kills then, hundreds of people. Yeah. Well we don't see the hundreds, but we have to take the world for it, I guess. Oh, we see a lot of people, though. We see at least, I would say, 50 more just by this one Dalek alone. Uh, so I would say self-defense, but I guess it well, comes... I mean, I don't know if it's self-defense because at that point it was getting out. But obviously, yes, the Dalek, being a Dalek, whether it's a Dalek or not, did, no one gets you tortured. So, of course, it gets to escape, and I'm on the Dalek side there. And that leads into a uh, one of my, uh, a pretty good, another really good scene is with the doctors talking to Van Staten in his office. About what the Dalek wants, as the Gremlins would say. Yeah, and that's a pretty funny scene because when Saturn's trying to understand what the Dalek wants, he sort of apologizes, like, hey, sorry for trapping and torturing you, we okay, fam? The doctor, though, tries to explain to Van Saturn that trying to bargain with the Dalek is it particularly fruitful. So he just asks, hey, what's your largest city nearby? And naturally, this is Utah, so it's Salt Lake City. The doctor asks population, Van Saturn replies, and the doctor's like, Oh, dad. When Saturn's reaction is like, why? And just doesn't da- understand. Yeah, and the doctor says, that is what a Dalek is, Van Staten. It's a creature of pure hate and mode. All it wants is, I believe the doctor phrases, it believes that it's correct. That, you know, it believes that it is a, cre- a species that o- they should be the only ones in existence. 
And that's what Van Staden basically unleashed, even though it wasn't really Van Staden's fault technically. The Totsi was, but you know, Van Staden didn't. Yeah, to, to be fair, even if Van Staden hadn't had trapped and tortured it, the Daleks still would have done this, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, so um, that didn't actually change anything. Except maybe make Rose more sympathetic. Yeah, well, and not just Rose, but the audience, because I still feel bad for the Dalek. I do think the updated effects of the Dalek's killing looks pretty good, though. Like, early on, we see the Dalek using that sack of thing he has, and sort of, like, sacking someone's life force out through the face, which is always looks fun. Well, not for the guard. No, well, yeah, but it wasn't unfun for long. And the extermination effects, I think, look really strong. Naturally, it's a laser beam, but you see some scarlet. It looks pretty good. And this is seen probably one of, one of the, as far as action sequences go, one of my favorite action sequences, in which the Dalek's surrounded by something like, let's say, 60-ish soldiers. Well, I guess more... The soldiers, I guess. Sixty. Well, so, some, some of them wore like lab assistants. Oh yeah, that's yeah. And with pretty much like two shots of that, like able to take them all out. He just shoots the sprinklers up top, then gets the flow watt and electrocutes all of them in like a couple of far swoops. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, well, because that's what a Dalek is. There are small creatures that apparently can think very quickly. And it just knew the most efficient way to deal with them. And it was also cool when they were shooting at the Dalek. You can see the Dalek still has a force field. And you could sort of see the bullets melting before they got to the Dalek again. This series had more money than the classic Who series did. I can't even imagine what they would have tried to look like in the classic series if they had tried to do the same type of thing. And so he says something like that in Remembrance of the Daleks, which there were a lot of army people there. They had your side at the Daleks. And guys, what happened in that one is they were actually successful and were able to get rid of a few of them. But it looks really, it looks really good here. Now I know that we've mentioned before, not all the special effects hold up at other times. There's some issues here and there. But this, I think this episode has a pretty good special effects throughout. Yeah, I agree. Out of all the ones from this first season, I think these effects probably honestly hold up the best off the top th- of my heart. I think it's immediately after the scene in which the Dalek takes care of like 60s, 70ish people that the doctors, well, naturally, understandably unhappy. He's talking through the intercom and he's just shouting at him. It's like, why would you just die? Yeah, he's literally frothing at the mouth. Yeah, which, is is. Appa- which is apparently unscripted, but they decided to keep it in anyway because it just shows. Because Ar- Argerson liked it so much, he saw how much the Dalek has affected him. And uh, naturally, because the Dalek's a creature of God Zingus, a couple of seconds sounds and he just comes back, you would have made a God Dalek. Yeah, and uh, Argerson is not happy about that reply. Because you see on his face, he, he realizes that he has a lot of the angle that the Daleks have for the rest of civilization. Only he just basically pins it on one's pieces. And so afraid of the Dalek is the Ninth Doctor. There comes a chance in the episode to sort of trap the Dalek in, well, in the underground area. Just a shot of all the exits, trap the Dalek there. Now, it's not going to hold him for that long, I would think. I mean, this can be a momentary thing. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure how long it would take the Dalek to get out of that, but it, it would it take... It's not a permanent solution, is what I'm trying to say. Apparently, they can't fly the base with cement, so... Yeah, I just feel like... Yeah, no, eventually, it would have gotten out, but they could have really delayed and tried to do something, like fly the base with cement, then carve it out and uh, shoot it into space or something. I don't know. Yeah, but this is a scene in which the Dalek has a choice to lock out the bottom of this bunker, and to do that, he would need to sacrifice Rose, because unfortunately, Rose is still down there. She's running, trying to escape. Unfortunately, she does not run quite quick enough, and the Dalek, in a way, sacrifices Rose for just the chance to contain a Dalek. And that's another strong scene, too, because Rose, he hasn't known Rose that long, but it's probably one of the earlier, I'm not sure about expanded media, probably one of the earlier times he's had a, a decent connection with someone since the time war. Yeah, and the, I've never actually liked the line. I thought it was always a bit too on the nose. The Dalek says something about like, oh, do you want to risk the life of the woman you love? And like, the doctor's known Rose for what, a week? I don't know. I, I, I've, I've never liked it. It's much, much too early to try to set up the doctor actually have fe- having romantic feelings towards Rose. Like, Rose having romantic feelings towards the doctor, I get. But not the doctor having romantic feelings towards Rose. And, it's fast if the competition's Mickey. Well, granted. <laughs> but M- M- Mickey is still better than most people give credit for. Yeah, so it's a really strong episode. The ending, and if you've seen, if you've seen that, like, you know the ending's really strong, too. It's emotional, everyone's sad during it. Because when the Dalek sort of uses 
Rose's biometric data, it sort of changes the dialect too. I mean, so he gets some life force from it, but in a way, he also becomes mildly more human. Yeah, in a he way. Mute, yeah, he mutates a bit. And this actually leads to one of my annoyances with the episode, and it's not a big one. And I was just wanting to mention this before we got to all the episode ends, but it's when the Dalek confronts Henry Van Staten, and the Dalek is going to kill Van Staten, you know, saying, you tortured me, why? I, I sadly, I can't speak Dalek. And Van Staten gives excuses, you know, the ex- best excuses he can, which aren't very good, of course. And Rose just convinces the Dalek not to kill him. And I'm sorry, the Dalek has every right to kill him. Like, it wouldn't even have been a Dalek move to kill him. That's what you do. You don't get tortured for 20 years or however long he is tortured. And just, no, I'm sorry, my morality is different. You don't just let them go. Like, I've always hated it. And we talk about this a bit with the Dominators, where the peaceful move is always morally correct. Because no, it's not. It's not morally correct to let somebody who tortured somebody just walk off scot free. Especially if he, like, owns the precedence. I mean, no, he was not going to be tried for something like that. There are no laws to protect alien species, especially since nobody knows that aliens exist. So, yeah, sorry, the, the Dalek was right in the first part. Should have just killed Van Staten. My run's over, but that just annoyed me. Because it's, Rose is wrong. It's not, I, I don't know why Rose thinks, oh, the Dalek should have killed him, except not having any, like, more grounds to think about. Just a, it's just a general, oh, I guess it's a bad thing to kill. Yeah, and Van Staten's story arc, I, I'm not wild about what happens with his character. Just because, like James said, there's almost there's pretty much no accountability. Yeah, yeah and, and, and that's also very immoral, too. Sure, he loses access to all his money and such, but there's no accountability. It just, it, it's sort of disappointing. But when it comes to the Dalek itself, I think the ending's really strong. And I think everyone knows the scene. Rose is with the Dalek. They are walking in this corridor area. And the Dalek knows it's mutating. It knows it feels different. And it actually comes out of its casing. Or it, its casing moves back so we see the actual creature itself. Which I think, I forget, did we... We briefly saw the creature sort of in one of the early Dalek stories, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Obviously, the detail would have been as good since this is 2005, but I, I know we saw bits of them before. May, maybe they never did. They over our showing the entire creature because, of course, again, the effects. And I remember, I think there's a scene in a uh, William Hartnell story where they remove the casing and they're sort of disgusted by what they see in the casing. I forget which story that would have been... I would assume it would have been the first one. but I would, yeah, I would think so, too. But you can see the, the species. You know, it, it's a... Not the best looking species. I, I don't mean as far as the facts, I mean as far as its own personal health is concerned. I mean, it's like, they'll probably say the th- same thing about us. So that's pretty speciesist of you. I, I'm a species guy. But you can see the creature reaching out its tentacle toward the sunlight. And I, I think it's around this time the doctor has found a rather large gun. He's unhappy with all the death that's been going on today. And he is going to confront the Dalek with the intent to kill it. Yeah, and add, add one more to the death count. <laughs> yeah. So the Doctor comes in with his giant gun, Rose is with the Dalek, Doctor tells Rose to move, and Rose sees the gun, she knows what the Dalek is going to do. She's like, no. And she insists the Dalek's changing, and she moves aside, the Doctor sees Dalek, his case is open, and he's sort of confused, like, what's it, what's it doing? And Rose is like, oh, he's, he's reaching... For the sun, he wants to feel the warmth of the sun on its skin, saying it's mutating. And then she asks, oh, what are you changing into, Doctor? <laughs> it's sort of a sort of funny dialogue, actually. <laughs> but it, it's still pretty... Yeah, it's, it, again, that's a bit heavy-handed as well. But it's still like one of those, or what do they call it, armor-piercing questions. That is the TV trope's tone for it, yes. And the Doctor is, well, he sees what, he, he sees what he's doing. He sees this dialogue just wanting... To feel the warmth of the sun. And yeah, that just sort of breaks down saying, Oh, our dad rose. And unfortunately, you might think at that point he might ask a Dalek to come along with him, be a companion. But that's not I would quite like how a it. Da- I would like a Dalek companion. What it would have worked there. There was a Dalek Rusty, I think, who popped up a couple of times. Yeah, that was during the later Capaldi era. I'm not one, I'm not as big a fan as of that era, and two, I've only seen most of those once. So I know that Rusty was the Dalek from Into the Dalek, I think. Although even that I'm not positive, positive about. And I have no clue where he, they popped up again at all, honestly. I believe it was twice upon a time. 
Okay, I, I, you've probably seen it more recently than I have. I but, must feel like it popped up in one more place too, but I really, I, I truly have no idea. Yeah, I, I don't know either. But this Dalek knows he's alone, he's mutating, and unfortunately, so given the Daleks, I would think that their own species is sort of like the, the perfect species, any type of change is negative, and the Doctor realizes that. So the Dalek demands orders and roars, oh, yeah. eventually gets browbeaten into giving the order to uh, just kill itself. And then we get to see the uh, use for the round of things the Daleks have. Yeah, so naturally the Dalek design has these sort of foul round things on its casing. That I'm not sure if we've ever seen much of a use for them in the classic certainly have not. <laughs> yeah, they always look nice, but never got much of a use for them. But we see it sort of makes a uh, sort of surrounds the Dalek in some type of electrical force field. For, yeah, force field. That's what I was going for. It gets taken out like that. Yeah, basically, yeah. Not even any ass left, just gown. <laughs> yeah. It could have been a teleportation device if it didn't look so brutal. And despite the fact that Adam did it, in my opinion, do that much and even add that much to the story, he did have some heartfelt conversations with, with Rose early in the episode saying how he wants to, how it would be great to actually go out there, go out to space, see what's there. And well, Rose has a chance with the doctor's help to make that type of thing happen. So as they're leaving, Rose sort of wants Adam to come along with them. And the doctor, I think his reply is like, oh, on your heart, be it. Something along those lines. He doesn't seem particularly enthusiastic. But he also doesn't deny him. And he, yeah. denied, and he literally denied Mickey, so. Although he, like, obviously he would have given Mickey a chance. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the second time he gave Mickey a chance. In fact, he <laughs> asked Mickey to come. I, I, I was just like, he's not coming. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so he gives he gives Adam a chance. He doesn't really know Adam from Eve. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm much too pleased about that. But he gives Adam a chance and episode, well, episode ends. We probably went a bit more in detail with the episode than we usually would. I think it's just because I think the episode is particularly important in New Who. I, I, I enjoy the episode quite a bit. And we'll talk about our feelings on it. I think it's a really good episode. I think it's a strong episode. Not everything works out. Some of the issues with Van Staten, for instance, are problematic. And the morality. Yeah, and some of the morality is a bit iffy too, but John, I think it's a pretty strong episode. So what are your, like, I guess, overarching thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think this episode is pretty strong. Maybe one of the stronger ones of, well, certainly among the stronger ones of the fourth season of The Revival. I don't like as much as I used to, and that's true for actually a lot of the earlier episodes of the Revival series. Uh, the Grow in the Fireplace, for example, I don't like as much as I used to. And I just think this one's a pretty strong... I mean, while the Dash of the Daleks is wondrous, it makes them a very strong, fearsome species again. But the morality thing annoys me a lot, just because I, I hate it when stories act as though that's the moral thing to do, and I'm sorry, but I don't think it is. And granted, morality comes down to debates anyway, but I strongly disagree that the Daleks should have killed him. And I'm annoyed that Rose thought that that was wrong. I wonder how she came to that conclusion. I wonder how much she thought about it. I'll guess another owl. I'm pr- guessing she probably never took an ethics class. But yeah, in a lot of ways, even though a lot of the effects are more dodgy in the story, I actually like the story of the upcoming episode more than I like this one over Owl, the long game. Just because I think that's, that there's a lot of fascinating things and it's actually really good setup. For the season finale. Dalek, I mean, of course, Dalek also is as well for pretty obvious reasons. Actually combined, they work out to work pretty well together. And yeah. I, suspect, I suspect that would probably surprise people because I think when it comes to the first season, Christopher Acton's only season on TV, the long game is sometimes considered one of the one of the weakest episodes. Yeah, the long game, the Inquiet Dad are usually pretty up there as the weaker ones. The long game has a lot of things I like about it, and it always has. It's yeah, not like it's not like the long game came out of nowhere to you show up Dad. Like it's just that my liking for Dalek has grown less over the years. But it's still a great episode. It's just not I as great. I don't love as much as I used to. Yeah, I, I really like the episode. There's a couple of complaints here and there, but I think it's a very strong episode. It's a it's a great way to reintroduce sort of inexpected antagonist. Like everybody knew the Daleks were going to be appearing again. I think they did the Daleks justice by bringing them back and making them pretty fearsome. But before we tackle any more thoughts. I'm also sort of curious where this story fits with the you know, Doctor's timeline. Well, as listeners to our podcast know, we like looking at the TARDIS wiki, because the TARDIS wiki has personal timelines for each Doctor, uh, which includes the extensive amount of extended media, ranging from comic books, comic strips, uh, big finish audios, BBC audios, 
the multiple book ranges, such as the Voyage and New Advances with the Seventh Doctor, to the BBC Past Doctor Advances with our other doctors at that point. There's just a plethora of media out there, and it's just fascinating to try to look at it in a cohesive way, which is basically not possible, because Doctor Who content is a mass. But it's just fun to see with this choice with this cast and fit into the universe as a whole. So this toy timeline rise for Christopher Arkerson, the ninth Doctor, takes place in between the 2021 BBC audio The Asses of Eternity, which a BBC audio, not a big fitness one. I don't know half as much about the BBC ones as they do big fitness. I believe the BBC audios are mostly narrated by a single person, but I've never listened to one of them, so I'm not sure how true that is. I'd also be surprised if Arkerson was involved since he had a pretty bad relationship with the BBC as far as I know, after he left the role, for understandable reasons. Anyway, so the, uh, that t- story takes place before this one. And what takes place after is a 2017 Big Finish idea story entitled The Other Side, which was from the Ninth Doctor Chronicles, the Thor series, where Nicholas Briggs voices the Ninth Doctor. Eventually, Big Finish did get Christopher Arkerson to be the Ninth Doctor again, but I think that was 2019, and this was... The uh, Ninth Doctor Chronicles was our Nicholas Briggs voice acting as the uh, Ninth Doctor. And of course, he's the one who also does the Daleks. So it fits in very well with this episode. And this story is interesting because it's the only other story to feature Adam as a companion. And it, it has to be very careful because the way that the next episode starts, uh, the long game, of course, has Adam being very impressed, you know, with space and, you know, the space that he's on. So this story, I, I, we, of course, we haven't listened to it. Uh, this story has to do something very careful to make it. I think a lot of it takes place in the towers or something like that. I don't know the specifics. I don't read the plots for these things. I just mention them to you. So if you get interested, you can take a look yourself. And they were actually going to do more of these. They were probably going to fit them in kind of like how... They fit in, like, Chandy's toys with the Fifth Doctor and Perry. I mean, realistically, there wasn't room for that with the way that Perry and the Fifth Doctor interact in the case of Androzani. But I'm happy that they did try them out. But the problem is that the actor was apparently convicted for sexual assault. So they very quickly dropped the idea of doing any more for pretty obvious reasons. And so that's going to be the only, very likely the only audio we get with Adam as a companion. Which, you know, is a saying, but maybe you should sexually assault people. There are repercussions for that. And it's awful. Yeah, and Adam naturally didn't get that much in the way of, in my, in my opinion, he didn't get that much in, that much in the way of characterization on the show. I, he didn't have that op- much opportunity to be show. But honestly, I'm not that bothered by it. It was an interesting idea to have a companion that didn't work out. And they did, of course, bring Adam's character back in some comic book series that I can't remember the name of. Yeah, it's a trial part comic book series. Where he, where he is the main antagonist. And that is sort of cool. And that's probably fine. Yeah, so he doesn't... But the fact that he doesn't really appear much, he doesn't do much in the show. It doesn't, doesn't really even add that much, in my opinion. And especially in this episode, he didn't add that much. But I guess it's, I guess it's sort of nice that they tried to do a little more with the character for, for whatever it's worth. It'll be interesting to you know, listen to that one whenever we happen to get to it. But yeah, when it comes to the dialogue as a whole, I think it's a really strong episode. I think I can say it's probably based off the revival episodes that we've discussed so far. I do think it's the strongest one. Yeah, I like the politics for aliens in London a lot, but the, the, yeah, humor, it, the humor takes that one back as well. Yeah, Aliens in London World War 3 was a nice one to watch again because it's been a bit since I'd last seen it. So that, that, that certainly was nice. But I think if you're talking about like over our, I guess, consistency strongest episode, I think this has been the strongest in the season so far. I, th- I think it does get beat because I, I think the Empty Child of Dr. Dantes might be a strongest toy. But so far, Dalek, I think, is a really strong toy. A couple of things I don't care for about it. But overall, there's a reason that it's like one of the classics of the revival. Yeah, it's a good reason. Like, I know my morality is the same as everybody else's, so I, I get why. I mean, funnily enough, my morality, though, is completely in lockstep with most, what most people seem to think about the Whitaker era, but we'll get there. I, I do think um, Corey Johnson, who, of course, played Henry Van Staten, I do think he did a pretty solid job. His character was certainly an asshole a lot of the time, but it's more of a sort of a realistic asshole. Like, again, he seemed like a human being. Bruno Langley, who played Adam, again, did, didn't make much of an impression to me personally, but was, I also wonder how much of an impression he was supposed to make. Probably not much of one. Yeah, I mean, especially in an episode 
which they brought back the dialogue. I mean, how much can a, some random side character really make in an absolute this much emotional stuff going on? I think yeah, he did. Good. Yeah, who I think particularly likable, in my opinion, either. Yeah, I, I think he did what he called, but certainly the strong point of this episode isn't Adam. So it's not even Van Staten. The Van Staten was an sort of interesting character, and actually, it's my understanding. This is a novelization of this story. I forget if it came out immediately or if it was printed somewhat more recently. Oh, I think it came out like 2021 or something like that. Yeah, there you go. I, I know there are some novelizations of Revival Who, and this one had a lot more detail about some of these characters. Like even the guy who's like torturing the dialogue, like, for instance, it goes into like his backstory a bit. Just some random, mildly fascinating things like that. And I suspect it probably went in a little bit with Van Staten. We got maybe a bit more character from him. But based on just this episode, I think he did a pretty decent job. But certainly the strong point of this story would be the doctor's conversations with the dialogue and the whole emotional maelstrom that's going on between the two of them. Yeah, those are indeed the strong points for me as well. Of course, we are always welcome to disagreements. And the best way you can disagree with us, well, certainly you can comment on this YouTube video. But you could also talk to us on Twitter. We are on Twitter at Brothers Mahoney. So if you have any comments, questions, complaints, reach out. Yeah, we love talking to fans of Doctor Who. Uh, we, we love Doctor Who. Like any discussions, we'll game. So what do we have coming up next, Michael? But next up, we have another Big Finish audio release, being the eighth release of the main range, Rod Down, which is a fifth Doctor story, Peter Davison, with Perry being Nicola Bryant. And the fifth Doctor Perry dynamic is one that we didn't get a whole lot of in Classic Who. It's just really Planet of Fire and Caves of Androzani. So that one, I think that one should be pretty fun to listen to. I mean, we've talked about a fifth Doctor Tolos story and a fifth Doctor Nissa story. So it'd be interesting to see him with another companion. Yeah, and funnily enough, a sixth Doctor uh, Perry story. So we have all the um, pieces, but now it's time for actually a fifth Doctor Perry story. Which, like I said earlier, the hypothetically should be a lot of, but there actually are. So. And actually, based on the cover of this one, it looks like it has to do with the Ice Warriors, which that should be fun too. Yeah, the Ice Warriors never like got any exposure in the main in the classic series past the third Doctor's time. So yeah, first Doctor Ice Warriors story sounds really exciting. So indeed, that's what we were talking about next. So that, yeah, that's been our thoughts on Dalek. As always, been been a fun conversation. I am Michael, and I'm James, and I hope that you've enjoyed listening. Have a nice night.